Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Rostenberg again with Beyond MTHFR, and I have a bit of data I want to share with you today. I have a, a, a video that I have waited a long time to, to make, um, so I'm excited that I'm finally getting a chance to put this together, and this is um, affectionately called Yeast is a Beast, the MTHFR and Candida Connection, and Many of you out there uh, who are researchers or patients, doctors interested in this, uh, you know, cutting edge functional medicine uh, that involves epigenetics, the kind of uh, stuff that we look at with Beyond MTHFR, you're, you're obviously aware of candida. But even if it's something you're just hearing about for the first time, just kind of trying to figure out what's going on, I think this video uh, will be useful to you. And, and my goal in this is to, uh, to highlight the connection between having a candida overgrowth and having problems in your methylation cycle because they go hand in hand. Um, so just to get started here, obviously this is a picture of someone's esophagus. This is like a, a colonization of the tissue in our gut because right, the esophagus technically is part of the gastrointestinal tract. So seeing this kind of picture um, and during an endoscopy, that's evidence of just massive fungal overgrowth. And that can happen not only in the esophagus, but also in the small intestine and the large intestine. So I think this picture does us, uh, does us well because it kind of gives our imagination something to think about. But that's literally what's happening inside of our intestines. We're colonized by this fungus uh, when we have this candida problem. Antibiotics drive Mainly, it's antibiotic exposure, overuse of antibiotics, standard American type of diets where the food is very high in sugar, it's highly processed. These are the reasons that candida is such a broad, wide problem. Okay, There's other complications uh, like um, taking steroid medications, hydrocortisone, other immune suppressing medication that can also lead to yeast overgrowth, but in my opinion, what I see in clinic, it is definitely the sort of residue from the overuse of antibiotics. And that you, many of you are aware of the idea of small intestine bacterial overgrowth, but we're gonna also get into the idea today of small intestine fungal overgrowth. Just a one word different, same concept, where you have an overgrowth of a, a normally occurring microorganism in your gut is basically growing crazy, going wild in your intestines, and there are definitely uh, health problems associated with that, including, and importantly, effects on your methylation cycle. So this data point in front of you just basically, you know, for a couple of years ago, broad spectrum antibiotics are causing fungal overgrowth. When you take antibiotics, people, it doesn't kill fungus. Antibiotics, uh, to my knowledge, have never been designed nor expected to actually kill fungus. They don't, they're a totally different, different organism. So when you kill all the bacteria and the healthy bacteria with antibiotics, there's less competition. The fungus just grows and takes over. I mean, who can blame them, right? A huge proportion of our clinic is geared around gastrointestinal complaints because that is a big area that's causing suffering to our fellow, you know, man and woman, right? That's a that's a, a big problem out there. And small intestinal fungal overgrowth is characterized by abdominal pain, bloating, distension, diarrhea, intolerance to sugars. You're hungry. Ninety minutes after you eat, your stomach's always growling. Even though you eat food, it's hard to gain weight. You know, these are really common symptoms. You have a white tongue. You, if you're a female, you've dealt with, uh, you know, bacterial vagin, uh, or excuse me. Um, you know, fungal overgrowth in the vaginal area. If you're a male, you have, you know, and a female could, could be this next category too. A lot of fungus in the toenails. You know, people are always trying to put stuff on the outside of their body, on the outside of the toes to get the toenail fungus to go away. But truly it is an inside out problem. So these are just some of the common symptoms that you see with fungal overgrowth. The most common fungus that medicine identifies, that I would argue the most common fungus in our entire being, is the candida species. So that's why we, as we talk about candida and yeast and fungus, we sort of use those words over and over again interchangeably, but it really is sort of saying the same thing. Don't get caught up on the language too much. 
Here's another study from 2018 just showing people have had their colon um, partial or complete colonectomies versus controls. The SIFO category is basically showing you that they, all they had was a fungal overgrowth, okay, the dark gray, and then the, the dashed lines here show you that they had fungus and bacterial overgrowth. So you can see that, you know, in a healthy group of people, about 60 Six, 65 percent of people don't have any overgrowth so uh, whatsoever but there's still a significant portion of people who have fungal overgrowth and a, a large portion of people large component of that is bacterial overgrowth which we've covered in other videos but once you start to cut the intestine or if you've had your you know gosh if you've had part of your intestine taken out if you've had any kind of damage to the intestine any kind of stomach surgery to try to lose weight or any kind of intervention where medicine had to open you up and you know start cutting your your you know what your body had created and, and had built down there there's always scar tissue there's always some loss of function so this study just kind of highlights hey if you cut the body if you um, intervene to make make changes to the intestine surgically you're going to end up with a higher much higher rate of overgrowth of bacteria and fungus i think everybody uh, can agree that that would make sense this is brand new data coming out from earlier this year that they basically, uh, the researchers figured out that incredibly, right? It's not just toxins from mold or toxins from candida. It's literally the, the actual candida organism can cross our blood-brain barrier. And the important thing here is to understand that before this study came out, it was sort of speculative about, you know, how does candida you know, in our gut, uh, really affect our brain. And we know there's a lot of connection between the gut and brain. There's the vagus nerve. There's all kinds of neurology and chemical messaging going on between our gut and our brain. So there can be a huge connection. But this research component here just said, look, we injected mice into their bloodstream with candida, and then we found it in their brain. We found that putting candida into the bloodstream caused the production of amyloid plaque, the you know precursor and the the component of, of Alzheimer's that help that starts to destroy our neurons and, and help our you know help causes our brain to degenerate, and and the researchers basically came to the conclusion that it's it's causing memory problems. So when people have an overgrowth of candida in their gut, there's always a component of leaky gut, which means even though most of your candida problem is between your mouth and the other end in that GI tract. Our bodies are going to allow some of that candida to leak in when we eat. That's how our body gets nutrition. That's leaky gut. And that once that candida compound gets into your bloodstream, it will get into your brain and your body will make inflammation against it. And what they figured out was they saw a transient decline in cerebral function, which is, you know, your brain function, your ability to think clearly, remember things, uh, deal with stress, plan your life appropriately, all these things that we attribute to feeling healthy, we would lose that function is due to the effects of the fungi and the body's attempt to sterilize it. So the researchers are saying, look, it's not, candida doesn't go in our brain and like chew on our brain and destroy the wiring and, and degenerate us. Our body attacks candida when it gets in our brain and it attacks it aggressively and the collateral damage from that that inflammation is that it makes our brain degenerate it causes pre-dementia symptoms it causes symptoms that can be kind of scary especially if you're in your 40s 50s or 60s and doctors are start to say hey you have pre-dementia dementia symptoms um, that's a wake-up call you need to look at your gut and make sure you know work with someone like like uh, like myself, someone in our practice, other types of functional medicine practitioners in your area who can who are trained to find this fungus and help you get rid of it. Okay, so just a little background on that. Now, the big thing I wanted to share with you today, and I wrote an article about this as well uh, on our Beyond MTHFR website, is there's a connection between candida, you know, not just what I've shared with you with the pre-dementia, the memory fog, the brain fog, and the memory decline, and all of that, but there's a connection between the chemicals that candida makes and our methylation cycle, and it really connects over to the neurotransmitter cycle. Okay, so this is this is real important for uh, understanding how your genetics 
and your gut problem can give you symptoms. So right here it says the microbiome produces many products including acetyl aldehydes. Okay, so aldehydes is what we're going to focus on for the kind of the rest of the vi uh, video in terms of what's coming up from the gut. Here's another um, research you know, snippet here that says acetyl aldehyde is carcinogenic and it is associated with cancers of the upper digestive tract. That is a true statement and it says that candida isolates produced high levels of aldehyde, acetyl aldehyde from glucose under low oxygen tension. What they're saying is when you eat sugar, when you drink alcohol, when you eat fruit juice, when you have orange juice for breakfast and you know eat pancakes and toast and pasta and breads and cookies and ice cream and all that delicious stuff our society is full of, you are feeding yeast. Yeast eats sugar. Okay? And when it eats sugar, it produces toxic aldehydes. And, and unfortunately, not only do aldehydes cause cancer, as this research shows, aldehydes interfere with the breakdown of your neurotransmitters. And those of you that have followed my videos and work over the few, last few years, you know, the, the word that I like is the catecholamines. The catecholamines represent dopamine and adrenaline. They represent chemicals that are fight or flight. They are um, the neurotransmitter version of stress hormones. They're essential for survival. Uh, they're very potent. They drive addiction. They drive anxiety attacks. They drive insomnia. They drive chronic pain. So much of our behavior is driven by our body's desire to balance these chemicals. And so when you have a gut infection with candida, I've circled for you on this chart. This is where this gut infection is going to be affecting you. These brown circles are going to get clogged up like a drain in your sink when you have a high amount of candida in your gut. And this is simply that candida is producing alcohol and aldehydes. When that leaks into your body every second you're alive, it's going to clog up these genetic uh, enzymes here because there's only so many parking spaces. And if you have a big gut infection, lots of candida overgrowth, you haven't paid attention to it or it's just grown slowly over time and now it's really out of hand, those parking spaces in your liver that said reserved for your dopamine, reserved for adrenaline, reserved for stress horm uh, neurotransmitters, they're just going to get clogged up with what's coming from your gut. So your tolerance from your tolerance of stress goes down. You're more anxious. You're having a harder time un un unwinding. You're on edge. You're snapping at your kids. You're having a hard time at work focusing and getting projects done. You have plans and dreams, but you know it's hard to execute because you can't handle the stress of taking on that project. I see this every day in practice, and I believe the main reasons why that happens to patients. When they first come in is they have these gut issues that are unresolved and as we clean their gut up and help them detoxify and, and help these pathways work better their whole life changes and it's a very rewarding experience so this is kind of the map of where yeast and candida and, and you could also also argue uh, mold exposure um, in the environment that's a topic for a different different video but definitely mold exposure and the chemicals produced by mold are quite similar to the same thing that's being made by yeast here but basically yeast is clogging up these pathways. When you happen to get your genetic report, I obviously uh, really like Sterling Hill's uh, variant report. It's the one I prefer to look at. It does a lot of um, you know, presentation of the information very well and it doesn't try to interpret it for you. That's my job, people like me, that's, that's our job to interpret it. Um, but this just puts the information in a really easy to read uh, you know, perspective. So these are some of the genes you would see in an, in an individual's genetic tendency. They would already have a genetic tendency with these COMT genes being um, red and the MAOA genes being red. They'd already have a tendency to have higher levels of catecholamines and stress neurotransmitters. They'd have, that would be part of their characteristic. When you add in a gut infection, you know, they can become mentally unhealthy very quick because of the stress that that places on their system. So that's the big connection between having a yeast overgrowth in methylation because methylation cycle does include and does involve the COMT, catechol o methyl transferase. This is a part of our methylation cycle, a very important one that controls our neurotransmitters. So yeast really makes a mess of that. Here's some more data on just, you know, I guess, you know, more evidence to back my 
back up my theory here that you know candida albicans releases aldehydes you know not my opinion it's right here in the literature when you see um, the literature on alcohol intake we know that alcohol ethanol uh, results in inhibition of, of methionine synthase and depletes glutathione so those of you in this world of research you know what I just said I said that drinking alcohol destroys methylation and ruins your antioxidant defense that's been published in the research a long time Another area we need to look at here, um, same kind of concept, uh, is that alcohol does not shut off methylation per se, but it is a it, it has an inhibitory effect on the methylation cycle. So it doesn't completely shut off your methylation cycle, but when you're exposed to alcohol, you have a higher need for folate, methylfolate, methyl B12, and other B vitamins. Um, and so if you have a fungal infection in your gut, right now, and you're listening to this video, your body's making alcohol every second you're alive. Or I shouldn't say your body is, I should say the candida's making alcohol every second you're alive and it's leaking into your system, affecting methylation. And here's the research that shows that. Um, another important area that we would like to explore in future videos, again, is this idea of histamine. And histamine and candida share the same parking space. As I said earlier, we have this picture where, you know, I was kind of talking about parking spaces, but in fact, um, the breakdown of histamine also involves these aldehyde enzymes. This is aldehyde dehydrogenase. This is um, aldehyde reductase. This is alcohol dehydrogenase. You know, you don't have to be a chemistry geek uh, like me. Just know that these enzymes, al aldehyde dehydrogenase, is also shown on this chart of where histamine is broken down. So if you have a large amount of candida uh, and fungal overgrowth in your intestine, it's highly likely that you're going to have a histamine problem. So we like to screen, you know, it's one of our, you know, sort of tells for people that they have a gut problem, um, they have a histamine issue. And here's one of the ways, one of the main ways that the chemistry imbalance from a yeast problem is going to slow down your body's ability to get rid of histamine. You're going to become more sensitive to allergens in the environment, seasonally, food-based allergens, all kinds of effects like that. Okay. But the last thing I want to share with you, kind of what the article I wrote uh, highlights on, is we have a symbiotic relationship with candida. It's not always that you know it's a toxin or a pathogen in our body. I want to point that out, that it's absolutely normal to have candida in your system. And the reason why is kind of uh, unique to, to investigate this. So tuberculosis is a horrible affliction. And ironically, the mold, the fungal-like species, it's not really quite a bacterium. It's sort of like a, kind of looks like a fungus, kind of acts like a bacteria, this tuberculosis uh, infection. It poops out a vitamin. So if you need a vitamin because your diet lacks the vitamin, your body might tolerate an infection and have a chronic infection for a long time because the infection is producing something that the body cannot get otherwise. It's, again, an interesting idea and it's what the researchers are saying. Tuberculosis has a highly paradoxical immunology for a pathogen and secretes and is inhibited by nicotinamide. Very interesting. What that means is if you look at this chart that's showing the intake of uh, meat consumption, protein, tryptophan, tryptophan steel, I've talked about this in other videos, if we don't have enough tryptophan we cannot make serotonin, we cannot make melatonin, and importantly we could die because we cannot make vitamin B3. So what these researchers have just clearly shown is that the black dots represent the infection of tuberculosis. Now here's where they come up with the vaccine and say, look, the vaccine solved the problem. That's a video uh, we haven't made yet, but yeah, obviously uh, that's debatable. But clearly the, the, the real decrease in tuberculosis, all the progress we made was from the increase in protein consumption and meat consumption. It's just that simple. So a body that lacks tryptophan, a diet in a poor country where they don't have enough meat, they're going to get tuberculosis more often. And the reason why is not because their immune system doesn't know how to get rid of it. It's because the immune system tolerates the infection because the infection poops out this compound called NAD. And again, 
not my opinion. That's just what the research share, is sharing with us. And I, and I kind of love these, these ideas because it makes sense. Bodies are not stupid. They're, they're perfect. They're geniuses. And we love working on nutrition with people because this is one thing you can help them with. If somebody, somebody's low and has a hard time digesting protein and they, don't, they avoid meat because, oh, I don't like to eat meat. It makes my stomach feel bad. And, you know, I, I, I'm thinking you know, the meat's not the problem. The problem is they can't digest their food. They need to have their gut worked on. They need stomach acid, enzymes. They need, they need to go through our process in our office and really optimize that. And, and lo and behold, they will enjoy and benefit from uh, animal protein. And if you're a vegetarian or vegan out there, you know, don't get too upset with me. There's obviously ways around that um, using plant-based protein, but the concept is the same. Okay. Another study uh, a few, just a couple years ago showing basically that high meat intake correlates with, um, with high intelligence, higher IQ, good health, and longevity. Okay. It's just a scientific fact. We need protein. We don't have enough protein in large parts of the world where tuberculosis is rampant. And that causes a, an infection to stay in, this per, in a person's body a long time because the body needs the vitamin. It doesn't care if it comes from the diet or from the infection. It needs the vitamin because if we don't have vitamin B3, it will kill us. And it killed about 120,000 people in the first two decades of the 1900s. It's called pellagra. So if the body can avoid having pellagra, it'll, it'll, it would rather have tuberculosis than pellagra, right? And if we can optimize their gut and optimize their nutrition and their absorption and their detoxification, you know, they would have neither problem. They'll, they'll, they'll heal from all that stuff. And it's just, show, just again sharing with you that tryptophan is the only way that we make NAD. And NAD is what we use B3 for. So there's this very tight connection between candida and... Um, tuberculosis and this molecule NAD. So I rec recognize this kind of a maybe more complicated uh, subject here at the end of the video, but I just want you to recognize that in order to make NAD, we need vitamin B2, B6, and vitamin C. We see those markers and many other markers on the organic acid test from the Great Plains Lab that we love to look at. Really a helpful test, helps us optimize people. But as I close, I just want to share with you again that it's the overuse of antibiotics okay predisposes us to having too much candida candida is normally in our gut supposed to be there but when you kill all the bacteria you get an infection a, a widespread growth of this stuff it interferes the, the yeast produces chemicals which interfere with the breakdown of neurotransmitters that's where it's affecting methylation okay it affects methylation in a big way and ironically we need NAD for these enzymes to work so there's there's just a connection between having a fungal overgrowth in your gut it's pooping chemicals out it's slowing down the genetic pathways in your liver and that's having an effect on how your brain works it's causing pre-dementia symptoms it's causing memory problems it's causing brain fog it's making you intolerant to stress it's causing sleep issues you know chronic um, uh, pain issues and, and, and that's to say nothing of all the bloating, gas, diarrhea, burping and just messed up digestion that goes along with this also. So that's why yeast is a beast. It, it, it makes people with COMT genes um, even more you know susceptible to the effects of, of stress and I hope you enjoyed that video and gave you something to think about and if you're out there you know, trying to figure out what's wrong with you, trying to research things on the internet. I applaud you. It's hard work. And, you know, you're on the right track if you found our, our videos. And I would just say that we work with patients from over 20 different countries, really the entire English speaking world. And, you know, we've had patients visit our clinic from all over the North America, even, you know, all over Europe as well. So there is an answer. We love helping people figure this stuff out. And, um, if you have any questions or concerns uh, about what I talked about in the video, please reach out and contact us. We'd love to help you, and uh, you will be better. So I hope, again, this video gave you something to think about on the connections between yeast, MTHFR, the, neuro the neurotransmitter pathways, and we go from there. So you can see that yeast is a big issue, and we can clean it up naturally. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.